everyone. I'm Dr. Michael McMammon, founder of CIP. And what we're going to do tonight is have a little interactive panel here. And at the end, we have questions and answers. And I'm going to let each person introduce themselves. And we'll start with Mary Lawler. Okay. I'm Mary Lawler. Um, I am the director here at CIP Amherst. Um, my background, should I have more information about my background? I have a master's degree in school psychology and a New York State School District Administrator um, certificate. So I worked in the public schools and special education for many years before leaving there and coming to CIP Amherst. If any of you are having trouble hearing in the back there, you might want to move up to these front row seats. We won't ask you any questions or do anything to embarrass you. That's what they all say. Okay. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Kennedy. I am a former student at, at the Brevard Center down in Florida. I am currently serving as the residential live-in staff. I also serve as weekend staff. Uh, I've been a social mentor, a general gopher, <laughs> driver. So I have a few different hats here. I've been taking master's level uh, psychology classes uh, for the last year at Medaya College locally. And, uh, Where are you from, Chris? <laughs> That's always the hardest question to answer. My family's in oil, so I sort of grew up overseas. My uh, parents are currently in Iraq, so yeah. It's, I've been in. Indonesia, Nigeria, did high school in Connecticut, California, Texas. It's very hard to nail down a place and say, this is where I'm from. Okay, um, Dr. McMahon, like I told you, I'd like to uh, introduce my soft side first. I have a, I'm a dad of six kids, and hopefully tonight or tomorrow or the next day, it's a week overdue for the, my 13th grandchild, who will be a girl. And she will actually have my last name. That's only one of the second one that will have my last name. And uh, and I uh, I'm founder of CIP 29 years ago and one month, and it will be our 30th anniversary next January, which is hard to believe that I actually did anything for 30 years in a row. And uh, and uh, I basically was diagnosed by uh, my own staff 10 years ago with Asperger's syndrome. And then I got formally diagnosed, and I'll talk about that when we get to that part of the program. And, uh, and what else? And I come from a family of nine children with a bunch of people on the spectrum and all different types of problems and situations growing up. And so that's a little bit about me. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask Chris first to tell us a little bit about how he got diagnosed, what he got diagnosed initially with, if he remembers as a child, because sometimes, if in most of your cases, at least the older you are, your diagnosis has changed as you've gotten older. Maybe they said ADD initially, then they said this, and they said that, and they finally got it right, hopefully. And so, uh, how you got diagnosed, and when, and, and what that whole process was like. Maybe somewhat of an unusual case in that I wasn't diagnosed until I was in high school. I uh, can probably blame that on the fact that there weren't many pe uh, what's the word? Uh, psychologists oh, living in the third world who were able to diagnose me. Though it was somewhat apparent that I did have some issues when I was in, what was in first or second grade. They had to fly in a specialist to get me to write up my assignments. I've been just attached. Touch resistant. Let's see. As I said, I was diagnosed at around 16 as a sophomore in high school. I just start, started boarding school in Connecticut. And things were not going that well. I was having trouble keeping up with assignments, and all my teachers were aware that I was bright. They just couldn't figure out what the issue was, so they decided to take a chance and have me tested. Time it was a toss up between nonverbal learning disorder and Asperger's, and I wound up, they decided I was nonverbal. So, I admit it, it's nice having a name for it, but at the time, I was not all that happy with it. So I 
did not want to be different and made the next six years very difficult. Let's just say that. <laughs> but getting, I was eventually uh, four years out of high school. I my parents found the Bard Center and very big difference. I managed to get my bachelor's degree. I'm not overdrafting every other week. Uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not kidding about that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm living by myself. I'm actually able to have an apartment that I can clean, I can cook. It's a very big change and my parents were very glad they found it, as am I. Okay, so we'll go on. So Mary, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with um, diagnosis and, um, and how you got involved. Okay. Well, I was in, in thinking about um, presenting this evening, I thought back to the first time I ever heard or learned about something called Asperger's Syndrome. And I was working um, as a CSC, Chair, Committee on Special Education, and in the Lewiston Porter School District. And the teachers at the middle school came to me and they said, Mary, we just, we have this, this boy that we don't, we just don't understand what's going on with him. He is as smart as a whip, but he doesn't get any work done. He daydreams in class. He never quite knows what's going on in, in the classroom. He doesn't have any friends. And, um, you know, he does these fairly bizarre things from time to time. And so being uh, also a school psychologist, I went and did a classroom observation and was really bewildered by this 11-year-old this, um, boy that I was observing. I had never seen anything quite like it. <clears throat> and um, so we had an evaluation done and came back that he was really smart. He could read great. He could write great. He was super in, in math. And so he didn't fit a lot of the criteria that we use uh, to put, put children in special education. So I told his parents, I really think we need to look outside of the school district and get some sort of a neuropsychological evaluation done. And just by fate or providence, um, they ended up taking him to a psychologist, uh, actually here in Amherst, and he sent a report back to me with an article in it on Asperger's syndrome. And that's the first time, I mean this is quite a few years ago, but it's the first time I'd ever heard of it. And I read this article and I said, wow, this is what's going on with this boy. And I think that what was really valuable in learning about it, find, getting this article, understanding, was that it put us, the faculty and the support staff in the district, it helped us serve him better because we stopped seeing him as this bizarre young man or young boy and being able to do some research and figure out how we could support him effectively. And I think that made all the difference in his middle school and high school years, that we could kind of define what was going on with him and serve him appropriately. So through the years after that, um, you know, I was a little bit more aware, a little smarter, and um, several students that I dealt with through the years with autism spectrum disorders that we were able to keep in regular classrooms, keep in regular high schools doing the college level curriculum because we understood what was going on with them and we could do what they needed to do to be successful. And so through those years I learned quite a bit about um, these types of learning differences. Now in addition to Asperger's of course we dealt with students with ADHD and learning disabilities and nonverbal learning disabilities. So um, the next development in my career um, was to, to understand when New York State changed their requirements for high school graduation so that all students except the most seriously disabled needed to get Regents diplomas. It was a huge challenge to school districts um, to make that happen. 
and so we developed programs to, to try to help our special education students accomplish that goal, at which we did, we did, they did, they, we started seeing all kinds of students who before people thought would never be able to get a Regents Diploma, get Regents Diplomas, which is, you know, a pretty good accomplishment. Um, and then I began to see that we were getting them through high school, and we were getting them these Regents Diplomas, but the statistics after high school were very clear that these young people were not going on to be successful in college. A lot of them would start college, but wouldn't finish it, or they were limiting themselves to community college. They didn't believe, they didn't have the vision for themselves that they could get a bachelor's degree or even uh, beyond that. And so that kind of started piquing my interest in how we could provide at the college level what needed to be done for these young people to be successful there. And uh, so I left public school and school age and started a program similar to CIP, but not nearly as complete and well-rounded. And so when I left that program, I was kind of considering what I wanted to do next, and um, I thought, I knew that the biggest uh, competitor to the program I was running, and I knew that the most significant program in the country was CIP. And so I called Michael one day and I said, would you like to start another center or something to that effect? He says, I always want to start new centers. And so, um, <laughs> not quite like that, but <laughs> close. <laughs> it's like having a baby. Um, so he, uh, yeah, so he, he came up to visit. He wanted me actually to move to northern New Jersey to do it. I didn't want to go to northern New Jersey, so I said, I think you should come here and see what this area is like. And he came, and the rest is history. Okay, I'm going to rein you in now, <laughs> back to today, okay. and we'll get going. So, uh, the spectrum, when we talk about the spectrum, we're not just talking about Asperger's, we're talking about ADHD, LD, everything is basically on a spectrum of learning differences. And it, all it really is, is if you, it's like... If you take 10% uh, of the population and say they're, they're just slightly different than the rest and they have these characteristics in general. And, 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 and the problem is, so for any of you, it doesn't matter if you're ADD or if you come into the center, you're gonna, you're, we're going to assess you and find out what you need in what areas. And guess what? The answers are not that much different. Yes, if you're a visual learner with a, with Asperger's, it's going to be a little different than a, a verbal learner. And so we're going to approach you differently and do th different things with you. But you're going to have, we're, we're going to go through each one of the departments and we're going to figure out what things you need the most of and we're going to put the most of that into your program and, and design it specifically for each student. Even though we're big, we're very, very individualized. So um, I'm not talking, so we're talking about neurodiversity. Now that they're getting rid of the word Asperger's syndrome, even though the psychiatrists don't know what they're doing and all of us psychologists and educators are totally against what they're doing, they're still gonna ram it down and it's not gonna work because everyone's gonna use the word Asperger's anyway. But the point is, it doesn't matter what you call it, it's about neurodiversity. It's about, you're, you're a little bit different thinker you have different abilities, and how do you fit into the world? How do you get where you want to go? When we had our student panel here, before you guys, some of you came, we heard a little bit from them about how they've learned to become self-motivated and see themselves. And part of that tonight, for all of you neurodiverse people out there, is to learn which, what, what you have and what you don't have, what you, where, how you, need, what you need to accommodate, what you need to change, and what is your best parts of yourself and then go with it. But if you don't know that and you go right straight into college or or the world, then you're at a disadvantage. It's like, you know, um, anyway, so I'll just explain a little bit my, about my diagnosis. I sort of alluded to the fact that my, my staff member, my academic coordinator walked into my office about 10 years ago and she was like my, I think I as an Asperger's person would have a lot of women around me who supported me and protected me 
from the world. They were my guardians, and they were my supporters, my counselors, and everything. And I always kept a whole bunch of them around me. So she was like my big sister or little sister, but she had a special relationship with me. And she came in and very guardedly said, I don't, I don't want you to get upset, but I want to talk to you about this. And, she's, and she went in a lot of cautious statements. And I said, just tell me, you know. So she whipped out this form of five pages of diagnoses, you know, of different things that, that typify Asperger's syndrome. And she started to go through the list and say, I think you have some of these, Michael. She started to point out to me different ones. Luckily for her, that I had been thinking about this myself a little bit. And um, shortly after that, we had Stephen Shore, who was on our board, and he's my Aspie cousin. I call him my Aspie cousin because we were so much different on the same spectrum, but the same. And uh, he came, and it sort of like made it clear to me that and later on I got formally diagnosed, but what happened, I'll talk about the benefits of that later. So she actually came in and did that, and then later on she came in, a couple weeks later, and said, same kind of conversation again, but she said, she had Temple Grandin's book, Thinking in Pictures, and she said, Michael, just listen to me, because it's really hard to get me, I was very, I'm very self-willed, I was very uh, cognitively rigid at that time, and I just did what everything the same way and the way I was going to do it, and you couldn't get in. It was like a sealed trap to get into my brain and change anything, or you know, or make me do anything I wouldn't want to do. So um, she said, "You got to read this book. You're going to be bored out of your socks with all the cattle." and everything <laughs> the, face, the first ten chapters, but she said, just persevere and get to the last two chapters and you'll know why. Would you promise me you'll read the book? So I read all through the cattle and everything, and I'm going, oh my God, I like I'll fall asleep, you know, or throw up one or the other. And I got to the end, to the last two chapters, and it's, it's, it was like an enlightenment of sorts. It said, oh, I didn't know that, I, that everyone wasn't the way I was. I didn't know that everyone wasn't a visual learner. Because I can go to Paris and take you back there right now after not being there for 10 years and give you a tour and show you around the town. And I thought everyone could do that. I didn't know everyone thought that way. I didn't know I was a visual <coughs> learner the way I am. And I'm an extreme visual learner. I mean, I can learn everything just by sizing it up and seeing it. But if you tell me about it or give me a textbook to read, I'm not going to get it. So I have to see it. And, uh, you know, it's like I'm from Missouri. Show me. Show me, you know, um, and so uh, I go to all of my competitors, and I see what they do, and I learn a lot from them. They're not really competitors or colleagues, but uh, anyway, so that's what happened. And I read that and it was like my Declaration of Independence. It was like, okay, there's a valid place for me on the planet. I'm not just this weird person who doesn't know what's going on, who has social trouble all the time. This is just a unique way of being in the world, as opposed to being dysfunctional. You know, thinking of yourself as, a, as dysfunctional or disordered. So we'll talk more about what happened after that, but that's generally what I, I want to switch to um, another part of the topic, and we'll come around. To, you'll see there's a, there's a plan here. And uh, so, Chris, what do you think the problems are? You've been in... And you were in the Brevard Center for a couple of years. You were in high school when you were diagnosed a little bit, right? And and then you've been working in the field with students. What problems do you see from students who are in non-acceptance or denial, or parents, for that matter, if you see parents too, who, like, sometimes the dads usually are still, even though the mom drags the kid here. She's going in with a couple of them. And it's because the Asperger's doesn't fall far from the tree, so you might have a little bit of it coming on in one of the parents or both. Or, you know, the ADD or whatever it is doesn't fall far from the tree, right? So it's like everyone has, you know, they might have some of it too, and they might have a little cognitive rigidity about it, even. So what are the problems that you've seen, and this is going to be asked to you, Mary, too, with students or their parents not accepting the diagnosis or them, themselves. I haven't seen as much of the parent aspect, but on the student front... You gotta speak up. Sorry, I'll work on my projection. 
on the student front, uh, when students are in denial or really just don't want to be here or and try and change, I've seen students who've essentially locked themselves in their rooms and lived off Cheerios for about a month. Uh, there have been students who fight at every turn uh, what, what we offer, saying that this is not me, I don't need this, I am normal. So where, what happens to them? What, do they make progress? I'm afraid not. I mean, it's, you can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped, I'm afraid. And it's, they're all very bright, and it's, from my perspective, it's self-defeating, and I just hate seeing it. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think it's, um, through the years, I've kind of seen young young people in three different categories. Now these are broad categories, but there's the students who insist that they're fine. It's the, everybody else that has the problem or the issue. Um, they're very closed down. They're not open to receiving anything from other people. They refuse to admit that they have any sort of need to change anything about themselves. And I think a lot of that is anxiety. But what what happens is when you're in that place, when you're in that state of mind, you don't, uh, you don't grow, at least not as much and not as quickly as someone in another category who has kind of come to terms with there's, there are things about me that I need to change if I'm going to be able to function effectively in the, the greater world around me. And what happens with those, with those students is they make much more progress much more quickly because they can receive advice from people, um, they can identify in themselves things that are hindering them or things that just aren't working for them, and instead of running away from it instead of kind of sticking their head in the sand or um, pretending that everybody else is, is the problem, not me, they don't, they're not able to make the necessary changes. Um, and then there are people in kind of the middle who come to CIP and they're, they have a lot of anxiety, a lot of concerns about being different and kind of self-consciousness, that kind of thing, where they um, are kind of afraid to know what it means. But they are open enough that in meeting with the staff, you begin to see them change. And some of the biggest changes that I see, the most significant changes that I see once a person um, makes the decision to accept who they are and not run away from it is... We can hold that because we're going to do that. That's the next question. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But with, you know, good things come out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I get, I have a, a psychology today blog and I get these inquiries once a week or so from usually women who have a husband who refuses to get diagnosed and are sort of living this painful existence of a rigid, rigid life with a guy who, you know, an older guy usually, who, you know, and they're seeing what happiness they could have if the person would go and learn about themselves and, and you know, be able to be open to the world and stuff. And it's pretty tragic just to see the under life that they're living, that they would have lived if this person was open to even some feedback about who they really are in the world and getting a little bit of just counseling or help to, to start to ease up and the anxiety and the, and the rigidity and stuff. So uh, I get a lot of that all the time and uh, our goal in our program is to have students become self-change agents. In order to do that you have to know who you are. So if you don't, if you won't accept who you are, first of all you need to understand your diagnosis. That doesn't mean, if we, we ask new students or if I ask kids in general, Tell me about your diagnosis. They'll say, well, I was diagnosed with ADHD, or 
I have some processing problems, or I, you know, have some social difficulties, or I have Asperger's and I have some social difficulties. But they, that's all they can tell you. So if you had cancer, you'd learn every bit about it. You'd learn every doctor in Buffalo or in New York City or Boston Children's Hospital. You'd know everything about the treatments and everything. And that's a disease. This is not a disease or a disorder, despite what the psychiatrists say in DSM-5. It's not a disorder. It's a learning difference. It's a different way of being in the world. Why wouldn't you want to know everything about yourself? So our goal in our program is part of that, is that kids coming in here will learn all the aspects of each part of their diagnosis. So what are your social thinking issues? And how do you, and do you need a lot of work in that area? Do you need how to have a conversation, how to talk to someone, your eye contact? You know, what, what do you need to work on? Your sensory issues. I didn't even know I had sensory issues. I'm really suffering today with these lights for like since 8 a.m. So it's or 8.30. It's going to be hard. It's hard. For the last couple hours here, it's going to be hard. But the, so how do you, do you know your sensory issues? Do you know, um, do you know your executive functioning issues? What are you good at? Where, how are you organized? Are you a good organizer? I, I was a good organizer in my personal dress and in that home, but with my academics, forget it. And I had good values. I knew to be work on be on work on time and those things, but I didn't know how to advocate at work or all the other aspects of that and having a conversation or, or problem solving. So there's lots of other issues besides just your diagnosis. It's, it's knowing your whole self, understanding the diagnosis, then accepting it. It's not a death sentence. Who cares what the name is? It's Asperger's or ADHD, doesn't matter. But then being true to yourself and working on that and say, how do I fit into this world? How do I accommodate the neurotypicals who run the planet? We aren't going to run it, so how do we get fit into their world? If, if we speak Chinese and they speak English, we're going to have to learn English. If we want to fit into the neurotypical world, that means doing as they do if they only talk about five minutes and then they let the other person talk, then we have to learn to do that. And we can't just talk on about what we want to talk about. So it's all of those accommodations that we have to learn. But first of all, we have to know who we are. It's like, should thine own self be true, right? If you don't know who you are, how can you confidently go out into the world? When I heard, was it Ben in the panel on this end? Mm -hmm who said, I feel a sense of confidence, I wake up in the morning liking myself. Well, if you know who you are, and you know what makes you tick, and then you can go out and effectively, what's self-esteem? It's being able to effectively problem solve and feeling good about it afterwards. Like, hey, I did that. And you have pride, right? Well, if you know how to, if you can confidently navigate, 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 navigate the world, then you feel a lot more confidence, right, in what you do. So if you look at, and I'm going to go to another issue in a minute, but if you look at me in 10 years, what you saw was this person that was fighting everything <laughs> to get where they wanted to go all the time, in conflict, very narrow interests, narrow food, narrow scope of being able to socialize, and, and my results were the same. If you look at the 10 years post-diagnosis, you have a whole different life. You know, I, mean, I can talk with anyone about anything now. I can go up and just chit-chat because I like it now. I've learned to like the social fabric. Before, I thought it was boring and dull because people talk about the weather and other stupid things and, and, they, and, and all that chit-chat is a waste of time. Why don't they work on something important, you know? So, things change and... Um, See what else we have here. So the, the concept is that if you know yourself, first you understand your diagnosis, then you accept it, then you're able to um, take it into the world. You self self advocate and self disclose, but you can't disclose or advocate if you don't know who you are and what accommodations you need, and and then that's anywhere work, in your relationship, you know, you have to be able to explain in your relationship. You have to do a lot of saying, I'm sorry, in your relationship. <laughs> sorry I said that. I won't do it again. If I do it again, I'm sorry ahead of time. You know, because it's going to happen probably. And uh, 
but you need to be able to do all those things to accommodate in the world. That means if you're a visual learner, you need to ask for that. You need to say, listen, can you write this down for me? Can you send me an email telling me what you want there? So I can, because if you just say it to me verbally, I'm not going to remember. And I tell my staff all the time, send me it like, I think it was, what's your name again? I'm sorry. My brain. Martha. Right, Martha. Who I asked her to get some name holders for the doors today. So we looked that up and she did. And I said, she brought it to me on a piece of paper. And I said, can you just email me that instead? So that I can just send it right on and tell people it's approved and everything. And so um, you need to ask for what you want. And, um, and so we're going to go on to the next question. So Chris, what have been the benefits for you in all the different areas, social, emotional, academic, or whatever, of your diagnosis, the benefits of understanding your diagnosis? Once I finally accepted it six years later and started the program, I, painful as it is to admit, I tried college beforehand and wound up getting a 1.73 GPA. Uh, once I started accepting it and working with it, I managed to get through with my Bachelor's of Science. I think the in major GPA was around a 3.7. So that was, that was a definite advantage. I also learned how to manage my finances much, much better. It's a lot cheaper when you actually cook and not eat out every week. <laughs> Better on the wasteland, too. Let's see. Emotionally, oof. I was a wreck for a bit, but I'm. It's, once you know what's going on and actually get some successes going, it makes it much easier and. I just recently joined the choir and am uh, meeting some new people who will hopefully get me out and explore some more of Buffalo. I've been meaning to do that for the last few years. It's just a little too easy to get wrapped up in the job. It's, hey, great guys. Oh, that's a good perspective. So, it, it, you know, how old are you now? If 29 as of about two okay. weeks ago. So. Emotionally, socially, you're probably more like 23, and that's all right. And we're slow bloomers. It's not like a negative. It's actually a positive later on, believe me. <laughs> like at my age now, I'm very adventuristic and gregarious because I still have that immaturity, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but I'm saying that um, it takes us longer to form relationships and to be willing to make changes. And, um, and you know, do the same thing over and over. You're not going to get anywhere. Join a choir, you'll meet someone, you'll meet some people you can hang out with, maybe you'll meet someone you want to go to coffee with, and, or even date. And so that's the process, and it's, it's all right. You do everything when it comes at the right time. It doesn't matter, especially in our world nowadays, which is really great, because you can go to college at any age, you can do, you can get married when you're 35, it doesn't matter. There's no, the social stuff has changed quite a bit. So we fit into the world a little easier in, in the, you know, in the, whatever this is, 2013. So that's great. And so, um, Mary, what would you say um, the uh, benefits are of diagnosis? Well, uh, you know, I really agree with you. The, the biggest benefit I see is self-acceptance. And in order to accept yourself, first of all, you have to be aware of who you are and what, what makes you who you are. And then once you understand that and you accept it, then you can be, um, become actively involved in deciding what you want for yourself. And I, ca I call that self-determination. You get to where you think of you're open to more possibilities. And so you're willing to set higher goals for yourself. You're willing to believe that you can do things that you didn't think you could do. And that there's a place in the world for you. And you're a very, very active and primary person in making all of that happen for yourself. Because, um, and I, I tell my students, I will go to my grave believing there's more about us that's alike 
then that's different. And so everybody really, anywhere you go in the world, have the same drives. They want to be happy. They want to have meaning, meaningful work and meaningful activity in their lives. They want to have love. They want to have relationships. And so when you begin to accept yourself and become aware of what you need to do to reach your goals, you can begin to bring those things into your life. And the end result of that process is to be in the world, in a place that is good for you. And that's what we all want for ourselves. And so I think what it does, um, learning about your diagnosis, understanding yourself, setting goals for your life, working towards them, it's the difference between living a kind of small, narrow life versus living a more open and enriched life. And so it's it's everything. Um. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up the self determination because when I talked before about like self awareness, self understanding, self acceptance, and then self advocacy, self disclosure, and self determination being the last one. I finally reached that, and that's why I have an art gallery. And that's why I have a performing arts center. That's why I have you know. All the, the uh, an organic farm that I'm starting now, because once you do the same thing over and over really well, and like we were saying before, I think we said too, I mean, if you pay your bills on time for 30 years, the bank likes that. If you pay your staff and don't miss a payroll for 29 years, that, that's good. That's a good, a pretty good track record. And guess what? They'll they'll lend you the 3.5 million dollars to renovate a building and do an art center and do a gallery because you're a good credit risk and you do what you say and you say you're going to do. Those are some of the great Asperger, Asperger's characteristics. <laughs> and there was an article in the paper about ADH people being really good entrepreneurs because they, a lot of them have good verbal skills and they have just a, a good accountant or someone behind them and just they just go for it. Someone like Tom Cruise, you know, I'm sure he doesn't know what the hell he's doing behind except that he's a good actor and he can put it out there verbally, but he's got someone who runs his money really well for him, probably behind the scenes. Usually we marry that, right? Usually you marry the other half of what you need, <laughs> but you can't always do that. So, but, um, so self-determination is a really important part of it. So the assets of Asperger's or ADHD or being on the spectrum, uh, there's things that I can do now that I couldn't do 10 years ago. I can look you in the eye, I can listen to you and actually entertain the possibility that you could change my mind on something, which is a whole different, I know it sounds simplistic, but it's not. I can use the donkey rule. What's the donkey rule, Chris? Better know if this. You, have you better know it. Four people uh, talking to you and they all say it's a, a donkey, then it's not a horse. No matter how much you might think it is. Okay, and don't be a jackass. <laughs> Do what they say, right? So that's why this center is here. And that's why the other five are here in the last ten years. Because I follow the donkey rule. Because I don't know everything. I didn't know I thought I did before I was diagnosed. I thought you were supposed to have to know everything if you were a real man. Right? The maverick, you know, John McCain. You know, whatever. You have to know everything, and you can't pretend like you don't know anything. It's the whole American foreign policy, which doesn't work. You know, so, you know, you don't have to be that way in the world. You, It's actually a sign of strength to say, hey, Brian, do you know what this diagnosis means? What this thing, where, where it means? You know? And I run into that as a psychologist all the time. There'll be some term that comes up after being in the field for 40 years or wherever the hell I am. I don't know it. And, I'll have to say, and I say to them, can you, refresh, can you remind me what that means? Or I never heard that before. And I'm not afraid to do that now, but I was before a diagnosis. So, because why wouldn't I not be afraid of that, students? You don't have to answer, but because you don't get anywhere if you stay ignorant, if you don't ever know that term, if you're too prideful to say, I don't know that term, you're dumber for that conversation. Afterwards, you're like dumber instead of being smarter. So which do you want to be? 
You know, that's sort of like my choice now. So do I want to get on with it and know what that term means, or do I want to pretend like I don't? So one of the other benefits is being able to be feel like I'm part of the social group and part of the community, that I'm not standing off by myself or isolated, because I can have a conversation about just about anything now, and I can learn from it. So I remember the first time that that happened. It was, I mean, it was one of the first times. And this is how it works for us. You were saying how you just sort of it took you several years to join the choir. And that was probably a social goal for you for many years. Now you finally did it. Well, there's this theory called discrepancy theory. What discrepancy theory is, is like let's say you guys out there with Asperger's and, a, and, a, and a ADHD, you might have a brother or sister who's neurotypical, and they can do everything right. It seems like they can do everything right, and you can't, right? And so, it always, there's these discrepancies like, oh, my sister can date, and I can't. Oh, my sister can get her license, and I can't. Or she got it on time, and it took me two years to get it. Oh, my sister can, you know, has straight A's, and I'm struggling. Oh, my sister, you know, has a car, and, you know, she can, you know, she can hold a job or whatever, and I can't. So there's all these discrepancies that build up over the years, and then we finally take action, or maybe we don't, and we ended up not taking action, which is worse. So I had been, my brother moved to Las Vegas when I was owning, I owned three group homes there at one time, and it was a long time ago. My brother is very verbal, and at that time it was before computers. We did manual banking, you know, you went and wrote your check to the bank, Everyone's who's old enough that remembers it. The rest of them go, what the hell is that? But you, and you, and you did, you know, took your cash out or you, whatever you did. So I had gone to this bank for like five years, and my brother comes to move there to run one of my group homes. And within two weeks, we well, said, where do I go to the bank? I sent him to the bank. There's only one teller there. So I go to the bank after he did a couple weeks later, and the teller says to me, looks at my check and goes, Oh, you're Jim's brother, and starts telling me all about my family and everything. And I thought, gee, Jim has a big mouth. <laughs> and, you know, I had been going to the same teller for five years. I didn't know her name, didn't, never had a conversation with her, anything. He comes in here in two weeks, and he already knows her and told her everything about, and, you know, has a relationship with her, right? And I thought, he's just a dumb, big mouth. And that's where I filed it, right up here in my discrepancy file, saying Jim just is a big mouth. And I just ignored it. But when you have enough of those come up in social situations, and then you say, so like 15, 20 years later, when I'm, after I've opened the program, I'm on a rental car van in Indiana, getting off the plane at the airport, going in the van to the car. And I'm the only one on it, which is like danger, because you have to, there's only one person with the driver. So it's hard to ignore the driver, but I usually do. But the thought occurred to me, maybe I could talk to the driver. <laughs> this is a unique thing for a 53-year-old man, right? Maybe I could talk to him, you know? Maybe. Then I thought, what the hell could I talk to the driver about? <laughs> He's like, you know, 20-something. He's probably didn't graduate. This is my SB judgment. Probably didn't graduate from high school. I wouldn't be able to talk to him about anything, you know? So I thought, well, what's, like, what, what would he be interested in? So the cults were really good that year, the football team, so I said, hey, what about those Colts? And it felt like throwing up when I said it, <laughs> but I said it anyway, and even though I'm a Patriots fan, and uh, and then I had to hear about the Colts, which was worse, because I didn't want to hear about the Colts, because I hated them anyway, and then, and then I changed the conversation to what I'm interested in. So I said, well, where are the bicycle paths in Indianapolis? And he told me about the bicycle pass, and then I said, where are the art museums in Indianapolis? And they said, he said, well, there was an outstanding museum in the Southwest, which is you know, beautiful. And then by the time I got off there, it was like 10 minutes only or something. When I got off, stepped, literally when I stepped off the van, I felt this like rush of self-esteem, which I couldn't explain to myself, why do I feel this so good? It's because I had broken through this plateau that I couldn't, like the glass ceiling, I couldn't get through it. And I just did it. And I was like courageous and just spoke up anyway and said, you know, what about the cults, even though I didn't want to. It's like asking someone for a date that you, you know, or something. And so, uh, 
oh, that's how long that took to seep through my rock, this rock, for me to take action. So when I started the program, I'm going to shut up in a minute, was I saw that I was unlocking the prison doors for a lot of our students of lives of isolation and self lack of self-fulfillment. And that if they got this lesson, it could shorten, it would be like a greenhouse effect if they were in a program like this, where we could help them to, we could give them the right fertilizer, we could give them the right temperature, we could water it just right, and we could probably, you know, get that poinsettia ready for Christmas a lot quicker than if we planted it out in the garden in Florida and waited two years for it to, three or five years for it to bloom or something. So we could have them cut maybe 10 or 15 years off this cycle of frustration. You know, that here I'm 53 and I lived my whole life, I did some good things, had children, I figured out, figured out how to do that, but, uh, you know, it's not pretty hard to do. And, uh, and then I, uh, this is the danger zone for me, Sense my sensory integration is like going like this, and my mouth is still running. <laughs> so, who knows what I'm going to say, I'm, giving, I'm telling you right now that I'm not responsible for anything after this point. So, in any case, I can go on forever, so I'm going to cut that short, and we'll go to, uh, let's see, I just want to say that. So, we just finish up on one thing. So, I learned conversation skills, I learned social skills, I learned how to look at someone and judge what their, what their nonverbal behavior was. I learned how to spread my executive functioning skills from um, my personal thing into my business. I learned all of those areas of the curriculum have taught me while I'm setting it up. I'm like the, you know, the hair club president, the first graduate of the program. And, um, but really what it comes down to is meeting your primary needs for love, for compassion, for understanding in the world. These kids that we see that flare out, that have mental illness with Asperger's or something, and do these atrocious crimes or crazy things, or, or the suicide rate's high too, is because they don't know how to self-efficate. They don't know how to get their primary needs met in the world. I have a brother who was a psychiatrist who had Asperger's who committed suicide. He did not know how to socialize. He was great at telling other people what to do. He was very, very intelligent. But he couldn't run his own social life or emotional life. He had no clue how to do it. And, you know, even though he was that highly educated. So this is a problem for us. And, you know, the, the worst parts of the problem are being underemployed, being at Walmart instead of being part of an IT firm where you can handle it and where they, uh, you know, where you can have a really good salary, and or 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 having just a friend at the newsstand say hi to you and that be your social life, instead of having a wife or a partner in life that you can, you know, have affection from or whatever. We are affectionate people. We are emotional people, and it's very frustrating for us on the spectrum when we don't know how to connect. And so, that's a whole other thing, you know. Uh, and so let's go to the last question here, and then we'll have some questions to answer. The last question to answer for everyone is, what advice do you give to parents and professionals? If you're going to give them some advice tonight, what are you going to say to them? I'll come back to you if you're not ready. It's a lot of things that could be said. But... Think on it for a minute, and I'll go to Mary first, because she'll have plenty to say. <laughs> okay, what's the question again? <laughs> uh, let's see, what, no. Uh, what would I suggest what to parents? Advice to parents and professionals, they're right here. Well, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, understanding that there isn't something essentially wrong with your son or daughter. It's not about right or wrong, it's not about good or bad, it's not about broken or fixed, it's about helping them understand, like any parent does for any of their children, helping them understand who they are and uh, guarding them in a smart way. Um, you know, you don't want to overprotect, but one of the things that I think so many of these young people coming up through life um, just internalize so many negative things about themselves and 
to have those honest conversations with them about this is what it, it is, this is what it's about, this is who you are, this is what you can accomplish, and you know, helping them develop not defenses so that they're defensive closed people, but the tools to deal with people who don't understand them. And so that they don't internalize all that negativity and all that um, self kind of uh, self deprecation, you know, but to help them see the value of who they are and what they have to offer the world. And one of the things I say to the students here a lot is when you were in second grade, nobody recognized the value of who you are. But now that you're grown, you have strengths that are very, very valuable. You know, you're a great mathematician. Do you know how much of a shortage there is of great mathematicians? Or you're a great artist. Do you know the value of being a creative artist? Or, you know, but just to help them begin to change their self-perception from one of there's something wrong with me to I have really important things about me to give to to the world, to give to people in this world. And so as parents, for all of us as parents are, and our children, isn't that the most valuable thing we give them is a sense of worth and a sense that I have what it takes and I have what I need to go out and find my way in the world. So that's what I would suggest okay. they do. Ready? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> I just want to stress, uh, in my personal opinion, the importance of making sure your son, daughter, client, that they understand the di their diagnosis. Uh, if they're in elementary or high school, that they know what's going on, that they know what they need, and <coughs> for me, I'd say help them ask for their accommodations so that they understand what they need instead of just giving it to them. And so that when they graduate, that they know what they need to do for themselves, because unfortunately, no one's going to do it for them. It's, for me, it's preparing them for what is coming next. So. Great. So um, what I would say is that you can say the same things to your kids as we can say them, and they'll hear them from us, and they won't hear them from you. Because after high school, they you have like a 10-second threshold before they turn the switch off when you're talking to them. Because they've heard the same rant over and over, and they don't want to hear it anymore. I can say the same thing in different words that you said to them over and over and they wouldn't listen to you. And they'll listen to us. And they'll listen to our 10 staff in different ways and they'll relate to Julie or someone and they'll get it. And it takes that sometimes to find a way in. And then also, the analogy I use with the students is you're an Apple computer in a PC world. And an Apple computer is not dysfunctional. It's not disordered. It's it, 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 it's just a different, has a different learning system, and it's just as valuable. In fact, it does things that the PCs can't. It does music, it does art, it does graphics. And so that is like a mic, that's really an analogy of what we are in the world. We bring other gifts to the world. In fact, if you took us out of the mix, there wouldn't be any art, there wouldn't be engineers, there wouldn't be, I mean, there would be very few of them. And what we actually need to solve the problems in our economy and everything is an Aspie or someone with ADHD in every business and every committee in every business because we bring a unique perspective that would solve the problems because we're going to give you a clear, creative idea that's different than everyone. It doesn't mean it's going to be right, but it's going to be a well thought out thesis that you can say, well, that's another way of looking at it, Michael. You know, I just did this the other day online to my, I shifted my whole entire, the whole entire CIP nationally by realizing something about what we were doing and said, why are we so dumb? After 29 years, we've still been doing it this way. Let's do it this way. And everyone agreed instantly. I don't know why they didn't see it either, but I didn't see it either. It was something that is very common sense, but that we changed. I won't tell you what it is because it doesn't matter. But the point is... Uh, so we're going to see things from time to time in a different way. That's good. And, and, the, and the other thing I want to say to the students out there on the spectrum, ADHD or whatever you are, 
guess what? The adult world, you rule. If you can get to it through your adolescence, you know, and all the crap you have to go through in high school and everything, and the beginning of college with every, where all the adolescent <coughs> behavior of your peers and everything. If you can get to the adult world, that's where we're in charge because we've already been there the whole time. We're just waiting for everyone else to grow up and be there with us. And that's the world where we do well because it's like your dog. Adults are predictable. They don't, miss, you know, your dog will come and wag his tail, you pet it. It's predictable and structured. That's why we like animals. And because you can predict what they're going to do. But adults are predictable. They don't tease you. They don't torment you. They don't, you know, second guess you, try to play games with you as much as, I mean, they do, but not as much. And uh, they still do it. But the point is that the adult world is made for us. That's when, you know, we, we do well. So why would I ever retire from when I'm just getting it now? You know, that's what I was saying to people lately. Why do I want to retire when it just took me this long to figure it out? And now I can actually make a contribution and have things the way I want it. So, um, so I would say um, be a self-student, student of yourself. Parents, your job is to put your student and, and, and people, professionals, put that student in the right environment. Picture yourself like Temple Grandin's high school teacher who just was there as a resource but kept encouraging all the time. But let them find their way, let them make their mistakes, don't be a helicopter mom or dad, you know, let them find their way, let them make their mistakes, but give them supports around them, people they can go to, a curriculum or whatever that they need so that they, and they will start taking advantage of it. Uh, you can't force it down their throat, but you can present the opportunities. And CIP is not a perfect program in any case. There are a lot of other good programs, I can tell you about lots of them. And we just do it our way. We do it comprehensively. We're not the end all of anything. But um, we are constantly searching for better ways to do what we do. And that's really what your job is with your student. And you have to be willing to let go. Okay? You cannot hold on. You can't do the same things you did in junior high and high school when they go to college. Because you will actually cause harm. It'll, it's sort of the regression to the mean. Before high school, in junior high and high school, parents' advocacy helps. It goes like this. After high school, it goes like that if you advocate. Because you're, what you are is disenfranchising your kid, just emasculating them and making them look like they need their mom or dad to support them and really hold them up. Now, you do have to do what Don, Ronald Reagan said, Verif, you know, peace through verification. You gotta know what nukes are out there and who's in charge. Like if you're in a program like ours, you have to advocate with the program, with your advisor, and say, okay, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing with my child? You know, or you, this is my important thing. But you let them stand on their own two feet and navigate the world. Otherwise, you're paying, you're gonna just have them back on the couch. And that's what you don't want, right? So, and I, I'm sure that these are the goals of most parents. They want a happy kid and they want a kid who's productive and not financially burdensome to them. Happy, productive, not burden a burden. Those are the three main goals, right? How do you get there if you're working with a kid like this or, or you are a kid like this or you're a parent of a kid like this? Is you have to focus on what works. And, and so at this point, we were talking about this the other day, you have to find that niche that they're really good at not just computers, because they all half of them say they're good at computers, and they're and they're just into gaming. Really, that's what it's about, or hiding out. But I mean, what what's their real niche? What are they really good at? And how do you support them in getting there? And I would say all of the other things, the social, executive functioning, the sensory, and all the hidden curriculum things, are the way that you support them by giving them knowledge about themselves. That's why we do this presentation. It's like the fifth time I've done it around the country. And they've all been wonderful events because we're talking about that's the core philosophy of our program is that you understand yourself. Because if you don't know who the hell you are, how can you go forward? How can you go forward? So, and that's why I insist the students are here at these presentations, which they're not. No, Only they are. some of them are. And the ones you probably need to hear it the most are not here, unfortunately.
So it, it's too bad. So anyway, we will talk. We'll have some questions now, really quickly, and then we'll talk to you as long as you want to stay in the back and eat food and whatever. So, any questions? You can direct it to anyone you want. Bill, you got one? Spit it out. Um, yeah, actually, it's, um, okay, um, so I know you mentioned this once before about being diagnosed with after founding this program, right? Right. So what got you into it? Did, did you know that, that there's something that was calling you? Well, you know, first of all, program? most psychologists and psychiatrists go into that field because they're sick puppies to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> only, ha only a couple of us admit it. And then, so I went into that probably because of my dysfunctional family and my own, own, own diagnosis. But I probably started, if I'm subconsciously, I probably started the program as like my own little sheltered workshop mm -hmm. to learn about myself. When I think about it, in retrospect, I probably didn't even know I was doing that. But I had an affinity toward these kids because they were just like me. I didn't realize it, you know. So I think I was driven to the work because of those emotional and social needs of myself. So I was pretty, I would say I was pretty dysfunctional even as an adult with a degree in, you know, in, in children. Because I still was, and a lot of people on the spectrum will have their own business because then no one can fire them, right? right. You say something stupid to... You know, one of the people you can't get, you don't get fired because you know they say, well, that's just the way Michael is, you know. So that's probably your answer to your question. Other questions? Come on. Um, it's 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 a common trait that people who have Asperger's have difficulty reading pa people's facial expressions right. and understanding in innuendos and things like that. It's difficult forming intimate relationships and yet you've been married and had children. Right. And I'm wondering, without getting too personal, is your wife also Aspie? No. And it's, um, I'm on my third relationship. I am married. Uh -huh. But my uh, original wife didn't have the benefit of the diagnosis. Okay. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> I describe that marriage as taking a prisoner and then holding onto her leg for emotional support. It's like a dog holding onto your leg and you eventually want to shake it off. Mm -hmm. So if you're too emotionally dependent on someone and you don't have a life outside the home, it's not, it sort of drags that person down emotionally and, and I think that's really what happened. We're really good friends. We have to share these beautiful children. I want to say, if you listen to Leanne Holiday Willie, she's on our 